Imagine growing up in Baghdad and seeing your brother and cousin killed by Al-Qaeda and other sectarian forces. Imagine getting death threats from radical groups such as the Mahdi Army, a religious militia that once controlled large parts of U.S.-occupied Iraq. That's some of what 27-year-old Faisal Saeed al-Muttar faced during his childhood growing up in Baghdad and Iraq. Born into a family that prized analytical thinking, he wrote critically of Islam and lived a secular lifestyle, making him a target for radical groups. Muttar fled to the United States five years ago. Here he heads up Ideas Beyond Borders, a nonprofit that promotes freedom of expression in authoritarian countries. Al-Qaeda took over my neighborhood. I mean, they almost took over my neighborhood. Like, I, w I wake up every morning and there are dead bodies on the streets and, and beheadings. And I sat down with Muttar to talk about his life, his experience with radical Islam, and Ideas Beyond Borders' latest project, which is to translate into Arabic works by secular Enlightenment thinkers such as Harvard psychologist Steven Pinker, and then distribute them for free to readers in North Africa and the Middle East. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason. Today we're talking with Faisal Saeed Al-Muttar. He's the head of Ideas Beyond Borders, and we're going to talk to him about that organization and its aims in the Arab Muslim Middle East. Faisal, thanks for talking. Thanks for having me. Ideas Beyond Borders, what is it? It's a nonprofit organization, global nonprofit organization, focused on preventing extremism before it takes root. Uh, it's come from my personal experience as well as my professional experience is that most of the war on terror, and now we're September, so it's been 17 years since that happened, have always been dealing with the deal of the tip of the iceberg, killing the Bin Ladens, killing the ISIS's. But nobody has really been engaging that much with really how to prevent it from really escalating to radicalization and terrorism. And I grew up in Iraq, and I know for a fact that ISIS and Al-Qaeda did not come out of nowhere. Uh, it came from a result of really bad education and a really lack of information and mass ignorance. So the uh, established organization to actually, not necessarily to convert people, but to expose the Arab youth to a diverse set of knowledge. One of the main projects that you're doing is you translate books into Arabic. Yes, we do. For circulation into the Middle East, the Arab world, the Muslim world. Yes. What are the types of books that you're, uh, you know, that you're translating? So we're obviously very selective about the type of books. The category that we are, uh, that we have put, is the books that really open up the mind, that is, that stimulates curiosity, makes people really wonder that there is something out there other than we are constantly exposed to. The main. I would say the main focus is expose the Arab world to enlightenment values. The values that really has created that progress what we see in the world. The main one, the main book we're translating is Enlightenment Now by Steven Pinker, who sits on our advisory board, who kind of been kind of I call him like the Ayatollah of IBV. He's like a, <laughs> the, the the spiritual Ayatollah. He's not he's not the the, the Khomeini but more of Sistani version. So he's been kind of the the guiding principle. At least his some of his values are guiding principle. And so also, also like I mean, gave, uh, thankfully he gave us the right to pretty much all his books. Uh, several authors like Sam Harris, Majid Nawaz, have also given us access to most of their and books. And can I ask, is the core idea that has to sink into the uh, Arab world or the Middle East or the, the Muslim world uh, you know, of extremism, yeah. is the idea of secular government? Or what, what, is, what is so key about the Western Enlightenment hitting that part of the world? I mean, the intersection of religion and politics have been really a major problem uh, since millennia. Since, I mean, the, in, even with the Ottoman Empire, they tried to mix religion and government and then the regimes afterward. So I would say secularism is a major component. Also, the, the concept of critical thinking is not really common uh, because all of these ideologies and also authoritarian go governments don't want these governments, to, don't want the people to think for themselves. So I would put secularism as well as critical thinking and the ability to really question authority uh, whatever that authority is, I would say is a central component that we want to bring to the Muslim world. Because the moment that people are able to think for themselves, the moment all of this brainwashing and all of this dogma that they are being taught all the time will be questioned, and then that's going to lose many of its value. We tend to look at the tip of the iceberg, the actual Islamic terrorism or... Yeah are uh, extremists, but there's this, in, you know, it's built up on an education system uh, that, is, that is weak. Where is that education system coming from and how long has it been in place? If you look at it as a kind of a spectrum, you put, let's say, 10 being the ISIS of the world, the Hezbollahs of the world. There is, so people move gradually, sometimes quickly, from, let's say, zero being kind of the cultural, open-minded Muslim to the tens. 
So I grew up in the in the uh, in, in the education system of Saddam Hussein's Iraq, and then many of the Syrians are growing up under Assad, and then the ones in Saudi Arabia, uh, Saudi Arabia, growing under the kind of the Wahhabi, uh, and then Egypt is also under CC slash Azhar slash Muslim Brotherhood. Um, this is this is a mainstream like bad education that most of the Arab youth are getting. It's uh, there, there leaves no room whatsoever for any room for critical thinking, and, and that's why like. When, whenever there are so many polls are done, I mean, for example, you hear like so many people having contradictory beliefs. Uh, one of the, I mean, it's, it's not obviously the most accurate one, but they ask people like, do you believe Islam or religion of peace? They said yes. Like 70% of people, people said yes. And that's how Muslim audiences. Then they said, do you think people should be killed for leaving Islam? Many of the same people who said Islam or religion of peace said yes, the people who leave Islam should be killed. And, and, and that contradiction is not coming out of nowhere in my opinion, it's coming from really lack of being able to maintain reason. Uh, and the same thing for, for like questions about 9-11 and, and jihadism and all of these questions. I was like, do you believe 9-11 is a good idea? No, I don't believe. But do you believe that suicide bombing and killing civilians is okay uh, if you have a bigger goal? The public is gonna say yes. So there's like, this contradiction of the mind is, is, is ingrained because of many of these dictatorships and extremists really want to keep the people as ignorant as possible. And, and they have failed to some extent when the Arab Spring happened. I mean, the, the Arab Spring was kind of the beginning of people saying, stop it. Uh, stop it, not necessarily, I mean, there are so many reasons why the Arab Spring happened, we can, which we can discuss for a long time. But some of it is that we are not going to be listening to everything you're telling us to be true. And that is, and has been done successfully in countries like Tunisia, in which many of the people are educated and have been exposed to enlightenment values because of their relationship with France. And the goal is, is, is to really take that Tunisian experiment of education. That's why the Arab Spring is far more successful than any other Arab Spring. Like Tunisia, because the education, the population is educated and they have been exposed to these ideas of separation of powers, secularism, the importance of individual rights, all of these things. So even when they had a protest, it was less violent. It was about values. It was about people really wanting their rights. But if you look at the other parts of the region, like Syria, like, like Egypt, because many of the people were ignorant because of the regimes, you see that even the revolutions were not, they were, some of them were violent, they took a, a path of violence, and they were not really motivated that much by the ideals of French Revolution, <laughs> which is how sometimes so our spring has been portrayed. Talk about how difficult it is to distribute these texts. I mean, this is a great thing if you, you know, you get, Steven Pinker donates the, the rights yeah. to the Arab translation of Enlightenment Now or of his previous books. Um, how difficult is it to, to take that book and you turn it into an electronic form and yes. then you circulate it? Talk about the difficulties in that. The process is that we acquire the rights legally and then we translate them and then we edit them and proofread them and then make them available as PDF and also we're expanding to the audiovisual, good audiobook and others. In terms of reach, I mean, the Middle East mostly have access to social media. Uh, with terms and conditions apply, <laughs> because sometimes you get monitored and everything. And but now, I would say uh, one of many of the things that I love about the region is that many of the it's, it's one of the youthful most, most youthful populations in the world, and they have this tech savviness in which if the government is blocking this website, they know how to install a VPN, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we have multiple distribution partners in which they have we have pretty much access to roughly between 30 to 40 million people between the age of between 15 and 30. And these are social media pages, with, uh, and, and, and social media is actually playing a major role in, while well, it's a source for fake news for many parts of the West, but it's also a source of really spreading good ideas because that's not the, uh, the mainstream. So many people go to the social media for the alternative sources, and, and we're trying to make this alternative source just to be enlightenment now. So uh, we, we package the book and we make it as accessible as possible, uh, easy to click. And we're building our digital library is going to be done in three months, named after the House of Wisdom in Baghdad. So that's kind of to give it a cultural connotation. And I would say, I mean, other than, I mean, there are some countries who are much more difficult. I mean, Saudi Arabia, I would say, uh, they, the theory of evolution, the Wikipedia page of theory of evolution is banned in Saudi Arabia. Um, one of the issues also we're currently facing is that many of the translators who work in the region, mostly those who work in a more established translation houses, because there are blasphemy laws inside these countries, they cannot deal with us. They're like, if we, if we translate Latin now, 
And blasphemy can mean literally anything you want to be. I mean, the emir of Dubai, if, if, if he thinks that condoms are blasphemous, means blasphemous. So it's not necessarily a very specific definition. So one of the issues we're con always facing is that the publishing houses as well as the translation houses in the region were like, we don't want to touch this material. This is, and that's the reason why we exist, to be honest. This is actually because we became the publisher. Considering that we, we are based in the United States, so we're not ruled by, I mean, thanks, thanks to Allah, right? We don't have, we're not ruled by blasphemy laws and, and all of that. So we're kind of utilizing the First Amendments in the States. So that's why it's going to give us a great uh, ability to operate freely. And then we publish this uh, material online and make people access them from there. How much of the problem is an Arab problem and how much of it is a Muslim problem? Is the fundamental issue with Islamic radicalism rooted in the Middle East? Islam originated from the Middle East and what I think really, what I think what really makes the Middle East important, I think the most important, is because the countries that have happened to have the most extremist ideologies happen to have the most oil resources and natural gas. So while in Indonesia is important, and so is Malaysia, and so is Pakistan and Bangladesh. In fact, there are more Muslims in South Asia than in the Middle East. But we make the most trouble. <laughs> and the reason why we make the most trouble is that even, even though Islam is coming from there, but also the kind of the more radical ideas like Salafism and Wahhabism, etc. And with the help of oil resources and natural gas, it was able to spread its way to and South really Asia. really you're talking about Saudi Arabia. Mainly right? Saudi Arabia and Qatar to a yeah. certain extent with like the Muslim Brotherhood and Islamist material. So, I mean, these are countries on the top list of natural gas and, and oil. And, and, and there has been a lot of geopolitics in, in the war against the Soviet Union and all of that, that they have become a major, let's say, player in other parts of the world. So I think that if we really want to get rid of radicali radicalism in general, we really have to start with the Middle East. Because I think the South Asian radicalization is the tip of the iceberg of the Middle Eastern radicalization. So if, if and, and I've been optimistic, but also not optimistic about kind of the rise of MBS and, and, and Saudi Arabia, but um, in moving country from the sixth century to the eighth century is not liberalization in my opinion, but I think it's still better than nothing. So if there was reform uh, towards more human, humanistic or universal human rights approach, I think it will have an effect on the total uh, totality of the Muslim world. The 1.5 billion will be affected. Plus, like, I mean, Mecca is where most Muslims go for Hajj. I mean, mo many Muslims will have to be exposed to the Middle East in one way or another. They have to go to do the pilgrimage there. If they're not going to do, if they're Shias, they're mostly going to go to Najaf and Karbala in Iraq. So they're going to come to the Middle East anyway. And, if and you'll be there with a copy of Enlightenment. <laughs> well, hopefully that, that's yeah. one goal. Talk about your upbringing in, in Iraq, because, I mean, you're, you're in the United States and you left Iraq ultimately after helping American forces or, or Americans occupying Iraq. Um, but you grew up in a moderate Muslim household. I do. I did. Um, so, I mean, I left Iraq in end of 2009, beginning of 2010. Uh, I did grow up, I mean, my family, which is, I think the reason why I've been motiva motivated to really do the translation project. So, I mean, my dad's an orthopedic, orthopedic surgeon, my mom is a lawyer. Um, they both stayed in the UK. Uh, they came back to Iraq to fix the country, which didn't work, turn out well. And I was born, I mean, they had sex and I was born as a result of that. <laughs> and, uh, and then... So you, there's no divinity. There, uh, yeah, unfortunately, okay. I, I yeah. thought there was, okay. but, but 23 and me proved me wrong. Yeah. Um, so I grew up, I mean, I, I, I was born in 1991, so just, just right after the Gulf War and when the sanctions were happening. Uh, but because I was ex grew up in an educated family that very, I mean, I, I would say they're liberal even by European standards. Like the way I grew up, like my dad gives me a book and we discuss it every Thursday when we grill chicken and here's a Play-Doh and here's Karl Marx and here's Hayek and, and let's discuss ideas about freedom and human rights and all of that. So, and the goal from him was like he wanted to make his son to be a critical thinker. He's like, he's, he's a, he was, I mean, he's still a practicing Muslim of some sort. And he is like, I want you to think for yourself. That's really the goal. Like, if you want to be a Muslim, be honest Muslim and be comf comfortable with it or don't. So I grew up in this environment, but there was a clash of civilization inside the civilization, right? So this is the house I grew up in. And then the moment I go outside that, that house, then I am exposed to, I mean, especially post-Iraq war in 2003, 
in which Al Qaeda took over my neighborhood. I mean, they almost took over my neighborhood. Like I, w I wake up every morning and there are dead bodies on the streets and, and beheadings and barbers getting killed and all of that. So there was, I mean, I had my own liberal circle in Iraq, so that's actually kind of maintained, maintained my sanity in some extent. But the, Iraq became a war zone. And especially the neighborhood I grew up in became like the clash between what used to be called Al-Qaeda, now ISIS, and Al-Mahdi army and kind of the Shia militias. And they all meet up in my neighborhood because we grew up in like kind of like central West Baghdad. Knowing English from a young age, I was able to be exposed to many of these ideas because I, I'm able to learn the language, but most people don't have that privilege, let's say. So, um, so yeah, so it's been like, um, like knowing that many people are exposed to a lot of no nonsense uh, really motivates me to kind of correct that. The number of books that are translated into Arabic every year is oh, it's, it's tiny, a disaster. It's right? a disaster. Um, it's, I mean, the latest report we have from the UN, even though it's old and I'm trying to update it, and there's also MIT Media Lab doing some of that, is that there are more books translated to Spanish in one year than Arabic in 1,000 years. And even add to that, even something as accessible as Wikipedia, Arabic is rated one of the lowest in terms of articles. So there is an, a knowledge deficit. Um, and there's a knowledge deficit about what the, the values that really make society grow. That, that like enlightenment and, and individual rights and, and, and separation of powers. Most people don't know these ideas. And it's no surprise that like when America came in to win the hearts and minds, <laughs> that didn't work out well. We recently marked the 17th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. Yeah. What is the best way that the United States can contribute to a lessening of Islamic terrorism that doesn't, you know, actually end up causing more problems or, or causing as many problems as it might try to solve? Can I pitch my organization now? <laughs> yeah. This constant warfare and, and stuff. Not that I don't believe that there is some need for wars and once in a while, but I think that really engaging with the Muslim world on the, on, and really uh, being on the right side of history in terms of supporting the people who hold these ideas and spreading these ideas. I, th I think that this is, it's a long-term goal to make people uh, adhere to some of these values that I think makes them progress, but I don't think there is an alternative to that. I think that soft power and more engagement in education and really approaching the Muslim world not as an enemy, but as, as a, a world that, that we can help and we can learn from. What are the things that we can learn from? Well, I mean, there are, there are some elements within Middle Eastern societies that I think are good. Uh, I mean, we, we value family, we value, it's, it's a land of civilization. I mean, where I come from, I mean, obviously Iraq is a modern state, but I was born in Babylon and that's, a, uh, uh, and also the uh, Egypt, they have the also history with Egyptians. So there's, there's a lot to learn from the Middle East. It's a region filled with, it's a cardinal civilization. Um, and, and also one day, in once upon a time, which is when the House of Wisdom was there and all of that, this was an, an area which was very developed in science and progress and, and, and good values that when, while Europe at the time was actually living in some sort of dark ages. So, so I think that it can be done again. And if that region of the world succeeds and becomes better than it is right now, it's good for all of us. I mean, number one, it's good for the people who live there. Uh, it's good for the women who are constantly being uh, persecuted for not wearing a headscarf in Tehran. Uh, so it's good for the people there to follow let's say, the, the trajectory of human rights and, 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 and separation of powers, individual rights. And it's also, I mean, uh, if something that 9-11 has taught us, I think, is that the Middle East is the opposite of Las Vegas. What happens in the Middle East doesn't stay in the Middle East. You have to be engaged, and you know that violence is not the solution. So support the, the more the war of ideas and really g getting, and also we have to defend these values at home here as well. Are you optimistic about the near future? I mean, Europe is worrying me quite a lot. Uh, I, I think America ha uh, has a strong foundation that is not going to turn crazy. And also because America is not based on a nation, not nation state, but nationalistic identity, which is tied to race, which is kind of different than Europe. Europe has a history. There is a French and there's the Germans and there's all of that. And what's happening there, especially with the migration, also the former uh, immigrants who come from the Muslim world or the Arab world, is that you have people who have very strong identity and you have people who also have very strong identity and they immediately clash. And, and Europe 
was a birthplace for many bad ideas regarding to race and others. And, and this, even though they had a phase of kind of the European Union and peace and all of that, but these ideas can emerge again. So I, I'm very worried about the future of Europe. I, I think that it might be possible that a recreation of some sort of a far right movement that really makes its way to power is possible. Um, we can see it in some countries. Um, I think Hungary is one of them, and, and, and I think Denmark, they lost the elections, the, the kind of the party, the centrist party. So, yeah, I am very, I mean, Marine Le Pen in France, and, and I mean, thank goodness we got the centrist guy, but, but the fact that she was able to gain that much support is a problem. And also, I mean, when it comes to the states, I mean, we got, you get the travel bans, and you got the kind of the anti-Muslim rhetoric on one side, and then you have kind of the constant victimization identity politics that are played by the other side to the way that it's getting more and more difficult to have a conversation. It's really a nuanced conversation. And I always mention that like, if we look at humans, humans are complicated and they can be oppressed and they can be oppressors at the same time. And somebody can be facing an anti-Muslim bigotry, which I'm against, but this person can also kill his daughter for having a boyfriend. These two things do not contradict each other. So, so trying to just put Muslims on one hand as oppressed, oppressor, etc. You're not really, you're not really looking at humans and Muslims as a human beings. And we have to look as Muslims as a human beings and try to understand the nuances of their religion and their personality and the culture they come from. Until we get that, then we're going to continue to constantly be part of this rhetoric of, of the far right and the far left. We've been talking with Faisal Saeed Al-Mutar. He's the head of Ideas Beyond Borders. For Reason, I'm Nick Gillespie.